Second Chronicles chapter 32. That's where we'll begin. Let's review here for a moment. Hezekiah is the king that we're talking about and dealing with. There's so much written about him in Scripture. He's the 14th king in the line of David. That is, if you get, begin with David as, as that first king, although David was king over all Israel, and then Solomon, his son, was king over all Israel, and the kingdom split. But tracking from David down the line, we come to Hezekiah, number 14 in that line of Judah. And Hezekiah has led Judah into its fourth great revival, probably the greatest of all the revivals. If there's a tie or a second, I would say it's the revival under Josiah that we will see uh, as the last of the revivals. But he did it by reopening the doors of the temple. That's where it all began. The temple was shut down. The people were not going. And and Hezekiah said, no more. We're going to open this up, invite the people back in. So we saw that in chapter 29. And also in chapter 29, we saw that Hezekiah removed all the idols from Jerusalem. He cleaned out the great city of the king. He reconsecrated the priests and the people to worship God, to come back to the Father. Then he did an amazing thing, something no other king before him did. He restored the Passover and invited not only Judah, but all of Israel as well. Now, you've got to grasp this. The restoration of the Passover that we read about in chapter 30, just last week, is a stunning thing, because at this point, brother had been set against brother. I think I shared last week, it's like North and South during the Civil War, taking a pause and coming together for a a celebratory feast. That's what happened here. There was civil war constantly between Northern Israel and Southern Judah. There were family members that were torn apart because of this. Brother fighting brother until Hezekiah said, let's take Passover together. Let's go to the one thing that unifies us above all other things. And that one thing was Passover. We have the same thing in Christianity today. We have one thing that unifies us more than any other thing. And what is that? It's Jesus Christ and His crucifixion and our celebration. That's the celebration. We come to the table together. We break bread, representative of His body. We drink that juice, representative of His blood. And we come to the place of unity. We may disagree about an awful lot of things in the church. But there is one thing that always brings us together, and that's Christ and His love for us. So the people came together for Passover as Hezekiah restored that. This this revival is just rolling on in a fantastic way. He removed all the idols then from the land, he and the people. They left the Passover, and they went out and they said, let's keep this rolling. And they removed everything, even in Ephraim and Manasseh, up in the territories of Israel. They removed the idols. And then... Then, as we talked about Sunday, Hezekiah returned the people to the biblical tithe. A surprising and yet vital aspect of real revival. I still have people after Sunday not understand what I was talking about. I hope it wasn't you. (laughs) But I still, it it amazes me. I, I said all throughout Sunday's teaching, this is not about money, this is about transformation. This is not about money, this is about transformation. And I had two or three emails about people talking about money. (laughs) It's not about money. That's not the issue. The issue is, do you want a transformed heart? If so, you've got to let go of your money. If so, we have to learn as a people, but as individuals, to let go and trust the Lord and say, He really is my provider. And if He really is my provider, that is going to go to my giving. It's going to go to my trust in Him, the way I do my bills. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. It's not a plea that you give more to the Bridge Christian Fellowship. It's a plea that we offer up our whole lives for transformation. Not just every aspect, but that one area. And this is what Hezekiah did. He returned the people. He said, you need to start bringing the tithe in. So they brought it in, and there were heaps of blessing all over Jerusalem that had to be managed and administrated and cared for. And that's really what we do as as Christians, as stewards. We manage what God's given us. What you have... God has given you. It's not, I know some may think, no, I worked hard for it. No, you didn't. I mean, maybe you put your effort and everything into it, but God determined what you would receive. God, for every one of us, looks at our lives and says, this is what I want Rick to have. This is what I want Danny to have. This is what I want Joe to have. This, this is what their part is going to be from me. And then he allows us the privilege of managing that. And so we become stewards. We're talking about real transformation. And when we can grasp that, truly when we grasp that financial area, 
our entire worldview shifts in a way that I don't know that it can without grasping that. Don't be deceived, however, into thinking that this is the end game. What do you mean by that? I mean revival for the sake of revival. That is it's a subtle point, but that's something that happens in the church today. Chasing after revival for revival's sake. Going after the, 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 the fun and the experience of revival rather than looking at what revival is all about. Transformation is not destination. Transformation is the journey. We must be and will be completely transformed upon arrival. And to that end, Paul writes, It is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. And so our lives are about transformation. Transformation is not the end. It is the means. It is the direction. It is what God is doing until we get to the end. And I think when in the church we get caught up with the transformation itself as the end, We want to see revival. Why? Why do you want to see revival? So we can say we had a great revival at the British Christian Fellowship, or are we in the process of being changed and altered and transformed, and revival comes of that? Ultimately, gang, the last stage of our transformational journey is one that completes us, and it's the only part of the transformation that is instantaneous. Paul writes it this way. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. That's the instantaneous final work that the Lord does in that moment when we are caught up and we are changed completely and wholly. People have asked, well, after the rapture of the church, are we still going to be able to sin? I don't think so. Why would you want to? (laughs) We will be in a new place. We will be with Jesus. We will be in our glorified bodies. We will be completely 100% transformed and changed at that time. Until then, we're in process. And we will be every step of the way. It is God who is at work in you. Now, it's vital we recognize and understand that. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves easily discouraged because revivals, as we've seen in Judah, revivals last a season and then they're over. They may last a week. They may last six months. They may last three or four years. But ultimately, revivals surge and then settle. We're on the fourth one. In the run of the kings of Judah. There's going to be one more. But all the while, things tend to settle back down. And if we are looking for revival, for revival's sake alone, we're going to get discouraged when the revival settles. Oh, man, but it was so great when it was happening. I, I served at a church in Southern California. Some of you, I've, I've shared stories about that and that experience down there. And one of the things that was talked about all the time down there was the tent. And there was a season they were building, and they couldn't be in their building, so they put a big tent out, and for about a year, they met in that tent, and they worshipped in the tent. And everybody had such fond memories of the tent. But the tent wasn't the end game. The end was getting the building built so they could be inside and have the building. The tent was not the purpose. It was on the way there. And yet, years after, I mean, it was years when I got hired on, and, and the tent was a thing of the past, that they talked about, oh, how wonderful it was in the tent. And it will happen here. You remember when we were in the barn? Oh! so great that was real worship there that's when we really connected as a people boy that's when the spirit moved because the Holy Spirit loves the barn (laughs) revival for revival's sake is not the purpose we are being transformed day in and day out I I point that out because as we begin tonight things were golden for Hezekiah and Judah things were great the revival was rolling along And we see at the end of chapter 31 that Hezekiah did throughout all Judah. He did what was good and right and true before the Lord his God. Every work which he began in the service of the house of God in law and in commandment, seeking his God, he did with all his heart. And he prospered. And at this point, you'd be tempted to think, I would be tempted to think, I am so there. I've arrived. I mean, I have finally hit the capstone of my spirituality and my faith. I am the man of God that I always wanted to be. Here I am, Lord. I'm the best of the best. I got there. But there's still transformation taking place. You see, when we think we've arrived, we have not arrived. And in addition to transformation taking place, there is still an enemy trying to take me out. Verse 1 of chapter 32. After these acts of faithfulness, Sankirib, and that's how you say his name. I know you've heard probably Sennacherib or Sennacherib or 
Sindicherry or something, I don't know, but San Kerib is his name, king of Assyria. He came and invaded Judah and besieged the fortified cities and thought to break into them for himself. This is after the acts of faithfulness. But wait a minute, God. Things are going well. Hezekiah is following you. He's leading the people. Everybody is in joyous return to the Lord. Why would you allow an attack of the enemy? Why now? Hey, attacks happen, gang. Now when Hezekiah saw that Sankarib had come and that he intended to make war on Jerusalem, he decided with his officers and his warriors to cut off the supply of water from the springs which were outside the city, and they helped him. I'll talk about that in a minute. It was a brilliant move. Verse 4. So many people assembled and stopped up all the springs and the stream which flowed through the region, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find abundant water? So what they were doing was protecting against an onslaught that as the king of Assyria would come, if he was going to besiege the city, they wanted to make sure there was no water outside the city for him to tap into. If you've been to Jerusalem, it's a very dry place. It is up on a high place. It's difficult to get water up there at all. And so the few springs that are there, if those were unavailable, it would be a difficult city to besiege. So they stop all that up. Again, more on that later. Verse 5. And Hezekiah, he took courage and rebuilt all the wall that had been broken down and erected towers on it and built another outside wall and strengthened the Milo, which was a defense tower, in the city of David. And he made weapons and shields in great number. He appointed military officers over the people and gathered them to him in the square at the city gate and spoke encouragingly to them, saying, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be dismayed because of the king of Assyria, nor because of all the horde that is with him. For the one with us is greater than the one with him. Hear that before? Hezekiah said, With him is only an arm of flesh. You know, when I read that, with him is only an arm of flesh, you ever see the old Bugs Bunny cartoons where, where Bugs would go like that and he'd flex his muscle and then his muscle would go, Wah, and he'd kind of flap it in the wind there? That's what we're talking about. Hezekiah is saying, that's what, he, that's what the king of Assyria, Sankari, that's what he has. He's got an arm of flesh. There's nothing there. It's wimpy. It's pathetic. Because with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people relied on the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Now, I wonder if the Apostle John was recalling this story, this situation, this quote from Hezekiah when he wrote in 1 John 4, 4, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. We need to remember this, and I think often. (laughs) Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, because... Okay, a sound Christian faith, even one in the midst of the, the joy and the fire and the, and the rejoicing of revival, is still subject to open attack. You still are going to have the enemy coming after you, even when you're in the best place you could possibly be. In fact, oftentimes it's in the fires of revival that Satan wants to burn you. Because it's when you least expect it. You're flying high in a great place. He wants to discourage any furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He doesn't want people leaving the door excited and pumped up and ready to go, sharing the Lord. He wants to shut it down. He is the adversary, 1 Peter 5.8 tells us. He is the accuser, Revelation 12.10 tells us. Those two things alone, gang, that's your enemy. The adversary who is set against you and against all things good and godly. And the accuser who day and night accuses the brethren. He does it to the Lord, and He does it to you. Oh, you can't possibly be effective for God. Look at what you've done with your life. You can't possibly help out this church. Look at who you are. Look at the mess you've made. Then you're a sinner, man. He accuses. He sets himself against. And it doesn't take long for a new believer to learn this. Attacks come. Unfortunately, it does seem to take a lot of time for us to understand it. Well, we get it, attacks come, but, but understanding the why, that there's a spiritual battle and we are servant soldiers in it. We are called to arms in this battle. Well, how are we supposed to fight back? And there are many different ways Christians choose to fight back politically. I mean, should we form a Christian coalition and stand legislatively and express our faith that way? Many do. How about Culturally. Maybe we should fight culture, engaging in in the battle for cultural norms and and values. Maybe going into the schools, going head-to-head with the principals, writing letters, stirring things up to fight culturally. Maybe that's the way. Some do. Are we supposed to fight back intellectually? 
Maybe we should set up a group here at the bridge who can study apologetics and fight and argue. We can have debates. That's a good idea. Every Sunday night we'll have great debates and we'll invite some atheists to come in and we'll have you know, Danny stand up and argue and fight for the faith and have an apologetic time in defense of the gospel. Or is there yet a better place, a better field of engagement for the soldier of Jesus Christ? I was recalling this afternoon the old hymn, Soldiers of Christ, Arise and Put Your Armor On. We used to sing that, and I get all fired up. You know, I love singing that song. Any hymns, actually, that were were fast-paced, I enjoyed. But that one, especially, I think about it. Yeah, soldiers of Christ, I want to fight for Jesus. But as you get older, you start to wonder, how? How do I do that? I mean, how honestly do I engage in the battle? I know the pastor's going to say pray, because that's kind of, you know, a typical thing. Read the Bible. It doesn't seem like real fighting you know going on there how do we engage how do we fight an unseen foe how do we duke it out with the devil great questions what strategies do we employ and and what is that great field of engagement well come back Sunday Spencer and I'll tell you all about it that's what we're going to talk about Sunday but Hezekiah now faces a very seen enemy one up to this point by the way that was undefeated when Sankarib and Assyria came up against Judah undefeated in the world, they were marching to world domination. Hadn't achieved it yet, but they were close. They conquered most of the known world, including northern Israel, and Sankarib very nearly succeeded in building the, the world's first world empire. He didn't. That would be Babylon. Why wasn't it Assyria? Well, part of the reason is what happens in this chapter right here. Read on and we'll see. Verse 9. After this, Sankarib, king of Assyria, sent his servants to Jerusalem while he was besieging Lachish, and with all his forces with him, against Hezekiah, the king of Judah, and against all Judah who were at Jerusalem. And they were saying, and these servants we talked about in 2 Kings, I believe, 18, 19, 20, somewhere in there, a guy named Rabshika, who just went on a rampage, raging against the people and against Hezekiah, and tried to literally make a case for the people just laying down their arms and giving up. Rabshika did. We get a, a smaller version of that here. Verse 10, reading on, tells us, Thus uh, Sankarib, the king of Assyria, said, On what are you trusting that you are remaining in Jerusalem under siege? I mean, is not Hezekiah misleading you to give yourselves over to die by hunger and thirst, saying, The Lord our God will deliver us from the hand of the king of Assyria? Has not the same Hezekiah taken away the high places and his altars? And said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall not worship before one altar, and on it you shall not burn incense. This cracks me up. He's, he's saying, what are you doing? This is a pagan perspective. You've taken down all your altars. You don't even have gods to pray for anymore. What a stupid thing to do. He doesn't get what's been going on. He does not understand the revival that's been happening now in Judah. And no sooner had Judah become greatly encouraged... Revived to seek the Lord, passionate in their faith once again, here comes the enemy and he is scoffing and he's mocking. And that's always what happens. When you sense a revival of your faith, the enemy comes in making fun of it. Or family makes fun of it. Are you going to church again? <sighs> Come on. And so you need to realize how, how unintellectual faith is. You know, and people will jab at you. Sankarib's taunts are aimed directly at the spiritual revival going on at this time in Judah. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. It is a typical tactic of Satan. When subtlety won't work, when he cannot undermine you from within, he goes directly after your faith in a full frontal attack. He tries to undermine your belief. He will challenge the validity of God's word in hopes of dissuading you, dissuading me, from a right relationship with Christ. It's always how he behaves. What was it that Satan said to Eve in the very beginning? Do you remember this? Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, the serpent, more crafty than any beast of the field, said to the woman... Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it or touch it, or you will die. And the servant said to the woman, you're not going to die. Surely you will not die. 
Well, her name wasn't Shirley, it was Eve, so that's the first problem. <laughs> if you, Eve, you're not going to die. I know that's what God said, but it's not true. The very first temptation of Satan was an attempt to undermine what God had said. An attempt to undermine his word. Did Eve die, by the way? Not that day, but yes, she did. And because of the sin of Adam and Eve, death entered the world exactly as God said it would. Because his word always stands, whether Satan tries to undermine it or not. And let me just say this to you, gang. If someone ever comes to you attempting to undermine the word of God, to water it down, to lighten it up, understand that it probably has something of, the, of, of Satan behind it. The whisperings of the enemy. So verse 13, they continue on, these servants of Sankarib, saying, Do you not know what I and my fathers have done to all the peoples of all the lands? Were the gods of the nations of the lands able at all to deliver their land from my hand? Who was there among all the gods of those nations which, could, which, which my fathers utterly destroyed who could deliver his people out of my hand that your God should be able to deliver you, to deliver you from my hand? Now, therefore, do not let Hezekiah deceive you or mislead you like this, and do not believe him. For no god of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people from my hand or from the hand of my fathers. How much less will your God deliver you from my hand? The arrogance is astounding. Verse 16. His servants spoke further against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. He also wrote letters to insult the Lord God of Israel and to speak against him, saying, As the gods of the nations of the lands have not delivered their people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not deliver his people from my hand. They called out this out with a loud voice in the language of Judah to the people of Jerusalem. So they're speaking Hebrew, so all the people can hear it, who are on the wall to frighten and terrify them so that they might take the city. I've shared this before. Satan is a terrorist. He's not capable of the follow-through. It's more often than not big words to scare, to frighten. But he can't do what he often says he's going to do. Verse 19, they spoke of the God of Jerusalem as of the gods of the peoples of the earth, the work of men's hands. Truly, they did not understand what they were dealing with. This is psychological warfare at its worst. And and I get it. I understand why this godless pagan enemy of Judah would say these things. He did not understand what he was up against or what he was in for here. What I have to ask, though, is why does God allow this ridicule to be quoted in his word? This is God's word. This is his choice of what goes in, you know, and, and what is left out. And the Lord chose for us to read these words of ridicule against him in the Bible. Why would he do that? <laughs> to ridicule the ridiculous. That we might see how absolutely ridiculous Sankari really is to even say these things. To make it absolutely clear how false they are. I, I love Psalm 2. It's one of my favorite Psalms. Verse 1 says, Why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Mashiach, anointed one. Saying, let us tear their fetters apart and let us cast their cords away from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Listen, gang, when someone mocks your faith or scoffs at your passion, there are a couple things you can do in response. First thing, laugh it off. Laugh it off. That's what God does. Really? You're making fun of me? That, that's actually kind of funny. <laughs> You're come, you, you kings, big powerful human beings, coming against me? <laughs> Angels, you guys got to hear this. <laughs> Listen to what they're saying down there. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? Right? Laugh it off. Don't take it seriously. And secondly, lean further into the Lord. This is what Hezekiah told the people to do. And we, and we get, again, a much broader picture of this in Second Kings, where Hezekiah tells the people, don't answer them a word. Do not speak a word. As they cast out these, these ridicules, and they mock and they scoff, don't say anything. Just don't answer them. You guys stand on the Lord. The Lord is with us. He will deliver us. And Hezekiah was firm in his faith. And so the people followed suit. 
They were quiet, still before the Lord. They leaned into the Lord and they trusted Him to protect. The enemy can taunt you, but the enemy cannot win if you're leaning into the Lord. Okay? So laugh it off. Verse 20. But King Hezekiah and Isaiah the prophet, here's Isaiah, whose book I cannot wait to get to. We're going to have to, but I can't wait. King Hezekiah and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, prayed about this and cried out to heaven. And the Lord sent an angel who destroyed every mighty warrior, commander, and officer in the camp of the king of Assyria. This is God's response, and it's awesome. Now, again, more fully expanded in 2 Kings 19 and Isaiah 37, but listen to how this happened. Isaiah 37 verse 35 says, It came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when the people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. I love that description. There were the corpses all dead. (laughs) They weren't just dead. They were dead dead. They were deed. I mean, they were done. 185,000 one night. These people got up the encampment of the king of Assyria. They're ready to go after Jerusalem, ready to fight. They woke up in the morning and they said, well, where are the commanders? Where are the captains? Where are our strongest fighting men? And they began to look around, every one of them dead. How powerful is God? Now you might say, well, 185,000. Israel killed 180,000 men of Judah in a recent battle that we just read about. I think it was last week or the week before. So, I mean, God's powerful, but 185,000, that's not a lot of guys. Well, let me ask you this. Who struck down 185,000 Assyrians? What was that, Steve? One angel. Just one. That's all God said. He didn't say, hey, we need to send some battalions down there to take out. Come on, get my best guy. They just, is there someone free? In fact, some of you guys, one of you angels, you're free. Okay, dude, would you go down and just take care of this for me? 185,000 dead instantaneously. The God of Israel himself did not come against the king of Assyria. He had better things to do. He didn't need to. He sent a single angel. You know, Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane. The night of his betrayal. And you remember the scene. They come to arrest him. Peter thinks in a last ditch effort to protect his Lord, he's going to, I don't know what he's thinking. He grabs his sword and starts swinging madly and he cuts off the ear of the, of the high priest's servant who was probably the most threatening guy in the crowd. The ear falls to the ground Jesus picks up the ear, puts it back on the guy's head, heals him, and then turns to Peter and says, Peter, don't you think I can appeal to my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? A legion is 6,000 troops. And Jesus said on that night, if I called out to dad right now, 72,000 angels would be at my disposal. Now, do the math. One angel took out 185,000 Assyrians. How many would 72,000 take out? Now ask yourself, how powerful is Jesus Christ? The same Spirit that resides with His people could call down that kind of power. And and, and even far greater. I I love this. Revelation chapter 20 verse 1 says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key of the abyss with a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, bound him for a thousand years, threw him into the abyss, shut and sealed it over him. Not God. One of the angels. Once again. Satan, who people tend to kind of get this bizarre, twisted yin-yang theory. God is perfect good. Satan is perfect evil. They are equally uh, powerful and they're just battling out. Not so. All God needs to deal with Satan is, again, one angel. So this terrorist over here who attacks, sometimes from the inside, sometimes from the outside, is not as great as sometimes we think he is. Don't ascribe him the greatness. A couple things we can learn from this lesson of Hezekiah and the the one angel killing 185,000. Two lessons, really. Number one, don't mess with angels. (laughs) Take you out. And secondly, let me repeat, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Why are we ever afraid of anything if we're truly children 
of the Most High God. Why would we fear? Well, it goes on and tells us that Sankarib, he returned in shame to his own land. I think right here, verse 21, is the defining moment why Assyria would not go on to be a great world power. This moment. Now, 185,000, a lot of men. They had a lot more men. They could have continued to march on. Not only was it the loss of all these commanders, but it was the word that would spread quickly about what happened to Assyria when they went up against tiny little Judah. And it would spur the, the bravado of other nations around. And Assyria, from this point forward, starts to go downhill. Right there in verse 21. He returned in shame to his own land, and when he had entered the temple of his God, some of his own children killed him there with the sword. By the way, the battle happened, we know this from Assyrian uh, transcripts that have been discovered, but the battle happened there against Judah, 185,000 killed by the one angel, in 701 B.C. It would be 20 years later, when Sankarib was actually killed. So he did return home, and ultimately he goes into the temple of his God and his own children, they kill him with the sword. That's after 20 years that go by. It's according to the Assyrian historical annals that this all took place. So the Lord, verse 22, saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sankarib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others, and guided them on every side. I like that. And many were bringing gifts to the Lord at Jerusalem and choice presents to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was exalted in the sight of all nations thereafter. Now understand something here. Chronologically, it appears at the exact same time Sankarib attacks, or at least presents and is ready to take out Judah. At the same time of this outward attack, Hezekiah suffers from an inward attack. Now, when we read things in Scripture, sometimes it looks like this happened and then this happened. This is all happening at the exact same time. Verse 24, In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill, and he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord spoke to him and gave him a sign. Gang, this all happened at the same time. One of the reasons why Hezekiah was such a great king is that even in the face of his own mortality... He had some kind of an illness that was unto death. Cancer? Something. I don't know. But he knew he was dying. He's dying. The nation Assyria is attacking, and it all happened at once. Inward attack, outward attack. And Hezekiah still trusted the Lord. And he prayed to the Lord, we're told in verse 24, and the Lord gave him a sign. Now, it's an interesting story that's embedded in this verse. The chronicler does not detail. He just gives us, gives us the one verse and quickly moves on. But keep your finger there and turn over to Isaiah 38, because I want you to check this out. Isaiah 38. And Isaiah falls pretty, pretty much in the middle of your Bibles, close to the middle if you just open them up there. Isaiah chapter 38 and verse 1. Let me just read you uh, some snippets of this of this situation. In those days, remember those days were at, while they were being besieged by Assyria, so it's all happens, happening simultaneously. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, came to him and said, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. And right there, I'd be going, Are you kidding, Lord? Wait a minute, my people are under attack, and now this, and you're going to, this is not good timing, Father. What possibly could you be thinking? Certainly not my timing for me to die right now. It says Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Do you ever do that? You're lying there in bed, and you're just so frustrated, there's nowhere to turn, so you just turn to the wall. And he says, remember now, O Lord, I beseech you, how I have walked before you in truth. And with a whole heart. And have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. He was not ready to go, so he threw a tantrum. Oh, come on, Rick. That's, that's really kind of judgmental of you to say. I, I didn't say it. He said it. Skip over and look down in verse 9. This is a writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after his illness and recovery. As he's thinking back over what happened, he writes, I said in the middle of my life, I am... To enter the gates of Sheol? I am to be deprived of the rest of my years? First of all, Hezekiah, who said you had a rest of your years? Who said that you were owed that? 
The fact that we have any amount of life, any of us, is a gift from God. It's not my right, my privilege to live to be 150 or 100 or 50. That's up to God. It's His call. Verse 11, he says, I said, I will not see the Lord, the Lord in the land of the living. I will look on man no more among the inhabitants of the world. Like a shepherd's tent, my dwelling is pulled up and removed from me. In other words, I'm being ripped off. (laughs) As a weaver, I rolled up my life. He cuts me off from the loom from day until night. You make an end of me. I compose my soul until morning. Like a lion, he breaks all my bones from day until night. You make an end of me. Now watch this, verse 14. Like a swallow. You know, like the birds twittering around up here. Like a crane, so I twitter. I moan like a dove. That's how I know he was throwing a tantrum. He was twittering and moaning. Most men don't twitter and moan. (laughs) Unless their faces turn to the wall and their wives can't hear them. (laughs) I'm fine. Fix me a turkey pot pie. You know, I'm okay. (laughs) My eyes looked wistfully to the heights. Oh, Lord, I'm oppressed. Be my security. What shall I say? He has spoken to me and he himself has done it. I will wander about all my years because of the bitterness of my soul. But you know what's absolutely beautiful about this? He's in the middle of a temper tantrum and God still hears him. He's crying out his eyes. He's actually being rather pathetic. But God hears him anyway. So great is the grace of our Father, His love for us, that even when we're acting like children, crying and whining and moaning and not even knowing what to pray, and not even sometimes praying at all, He hears. He still hears. He still responds. Now, I'm not encouraging tantrums, but I'm just pointing out the Father heart of God. He hears you just as a father hears a child. Go back and look at verse 4. The word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying... Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of your father David, I've heard your prayer, which is, I think is kind. I've heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. Behold, I'll add 15 years to your life. Hezekiah, in this moment, gang, he gets the double whammy. Okay, He's attacked, invaded by this, uh, of his country, and invaded in his body at the same time, but the Lord gives him double victory. Not only does San Kareem and Assyria get driven away, but Hezekiah gets miraculously healed and gets another 15 years of life. Now that's all well and good, but gang, life extension is problematic, and I think it was a mistake for him to ask for it at all. Let me explain. Psalm 139, verse 16 says, Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, When as yet, there was not yet one of them. The implication here is God has measured out your days. Same as I was saying before with finances. God has determined to bless each one of us, give us what he has given us, to deal with as we do. Why? I don't know. Why do I have less than other people? Why do I have more than other people? I don't know. But that was God's determination. And so as a steward, I need to learn to manage what he's given me. Same with our lives. The Lord has determined, I believe, for each and every one of us, here's the length of the life that you're going to have. Here are the days I'm ordaining for you to live. And rather than saying, like Hezekiah did, I'm getting ripped off. Why do I only get to live to be 68 and that guy gets to live to be 94? I look at my grandmother Irene who died at 94 and I know what she ate. And it's not fair. Bacon and eggs with extra salt every morning of her long life. If I eat that, it's not good. We each have been given. Here's your allotted time. This is your life. This is my gift to you, the Father would say. These dates to do with as a steward cares for what I've given. Now, no doubt you've seen the phrase extended life on packages of batteries or motor oils or Twinkies. You know, actually, my, my uh, son Hayden, first day of junior high today, and, and he heard in his science class that Twinkies are made up of the same stuff as rocket fuel. So I thought that was, that was good to know. I just thought I'd pass that along. A bit of free information for you there. Just because it says extended life doesn't mean that it is. I have an example for you. I... Um, 
the government required long life antifreeze for my suburban. Found this out from Gary Kramer. We're changing out the antifreeze. He says, you know, while we're doing this work, we need to change the antifreeze. Well, why is that, Gary? Well, because if we don't, you're going to blow a gasket and it's going to cost you about 1200 bucks. What? Well, why? Well, because they used to have normal antifreeze in these things. They did just fine. But the government came along. The EPA said it has to be long life antifreeze. So the car manufacturers, the antifreeze guys, they got together and they said, okay, let's come up with a nice sticker that says long life antifreeze. And they stuck it on the same antifreeze they were using before. And that's what we put in our cars. But the gasket needs to be, the antifreeze needs to be changed or the gasket's going to, I don't understand how it all works. But the bottom line is so much for long life. Extended life. It, man, if there's anything America is about, it's just living as long as possible. Why would you want to? I mean, there, there comes a certain point, man. If, if, if I have to go into a nursing home, would you just take me out behind the shed and shoot me? Okay. <laughs> you know, why would you want to just keep going? Listen to this, though. This is a powerful verse that is easily overlooked in Scripture. Isaiah 57, verse 1. The righteous man perishes, and no man takes it to heart. In other words, we don't understand why. And devout men are taken away. No one understands. And Isaiah says, the righteous man is taken away from evil. What I would say is tragic that a man died at the age of 51. Oh, that's awful. That's horrible. Not for him. Not if he's in Christ. Hey, guess what? He's done. He doesn't have to deal with the same sin and bitterness and anger and frustration and lack of forgiveness and hardship and heartache that we have to deal with the rest of our lives. Now... Please hear me on this. This is not a validation of suicide. I think you would know that or know better than that. It's not saying, well, man, then why don't we all just be done with it right now? Well, that's foolish because we are in the transformation process. And if you're still here, you're not ready. If you're still here, you need some more time. God is still doing a work in you and in me. That's why we're still here. Or maybe he's still going to work through you to save somebody else. And if you take yourself out, where does that leave them? So we're not talking about that as a validation of of taking your life. But it is a promise of joy and peace when death does come. What we need here is a, a spiritual mental shift in the way that we think. In the way that we view life. Philippians 1.21 Paul says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Both are good. If I'm going to be alive, well, let me read what he's... If I'm to live on in the flesh, this means fruitful labor for me. And I don't know which to choose. (laughs) I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire, man, to depart and be with Christ, for that's very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. That's the right mentality. If I'm still here, I am here for a reason. There are people who need to hear about Jesus, and I'm here to do that. But man tell me that this evening Jesus is coming to get me and I'm like, bring him on. I'm ready to go. Let me ask you personally, are you good to go like Paul was? Or do you fight it tooth and nail like Hezekiah did? This is the the downside of of Hezekiah. He's a man of great faith, but when it came to the end of his life, he said, whoa, 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 whoa. (laughs) I need more time. He got more time. Unfortunately. What do you mean, unfortunately? Well, he did great things in his final 15 years, but he was not taken away from evil. Isaiah 57. I wonder if Isaiah wrote that thinking about Hezekiah. Thinking about Hezekiah's extended life and saying the righteous man is taken away from evil. Hezekiah was a righteous man, but in the last 15 years of his life, he came up to bat and struck out. Strike one. Strike one was pride. Verse, where are we? In verse 25. Let me, let me go back and read 24 again. In those days he became mortally ill. He prayed to the Lord. The Lord spoke to him and gave him a sign. And that sign, by the way, was very cool. He made the shadow withdraw uh, ten steps. That's right. Which is, you know, you could talk about it another time. We've, we've looked at that before. But he gave him a sign and he told him, I'm going to give you 15 extra years. Look at verse 25. But Hezekiah gave no return. For the benefit he received, because his heart was proud. Therefore, wrath came on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. So, strike one, pride. Somehow, Hezekiah got it in his mind that he overcame his illness, because you just can't keep a good man down, you know. And he drove out Sankari, king of Assyria. And so Hezekiah, saved by the Lord, becomes proud. 
of his accomplishments, of his great army, of his riches, of his life, starts to think, I'm, I'm the guy who's made this all happen. And pride is the first strike. Furthermore, he might have said, look at all that I've accomplished. Watch this, verse 26. Now, however, Hezekiah did humble the pride of his heart, so he gets to come back up to bat, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come on them in the days of Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah had immense riches and honor, and he made for himself treasuries for silver, gold, precious stones, spices, shields, and all kinds of valuable articles, storehouses also for the produce of grain, wine, and oil, pens for all kinds of cattle and sheep bulls for the flocks, He made cities for himself and acquired flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him very great wealth. Why did God give him this great wealth if it was going to stumble him? Well, he's he's still transforming. He says, you want 15 more years of life, Hezekiah? That's fine, but we're going to continue the transformation process because I see where you weren't really ready to go when I said it was time to go. So let's work on this together. Even in the matters... Oh, verse 30, sorry. It was Hezekiah who stopped up the water outlet of the waters of Gihon and directed them to the west side of the city of David. That's referring back to verses 3 and 4. And Hezekiah prospered in all that he did. Let me mention this. I said I mentioned this before. We're talking about there Hezekiah's tunnel that you can visit in Jerusalem today. You can actually you can walk through it. It's, it's a long tunnel. It's a little tight at times. If there are a bunch of people, you might not want to do it. It's... 1,750 feet long. It's an S-shaped tunnel. It begins down at the Gihon Spring by the Kadron Valley. And it weaves its way in an S-shape through solid rock up inside the city walls of Jerusalem. What's amazing about this tunnel is in the day when Hezekiah prescribed that it be, that it be dug, workmen began. One set of workmen down at the Gihon, others up inside the city. They just started tunneling through the rock. And somehow met precisely in the middle. That's how they built the thing. We know that from an inscription that was found that said we could hear them on the other side with their axes and we're like, hey! They're like, hey! And we kept going and we ended up digging this tunnel all the way through. They stopped up the spring down there, ran the water through the tunnel so it could be only on the inside of the city gate so the people would have water but so that the king of Assyria would not have water. And it was an absolutely amazing accomplishment. Hezekiah did it. But this accomplishment, along with the other acts of greatness and his riches and all that he did in his life, led to pride. And pride here is defined for us as giving no return for the benefit he received. That's a great definition for pride. Giving no return for the benefit he received. Psalm 103, verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Who pardons all your iniquities heals all your diseases, redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. And let me just say this to you, gang. If we don't show loving kindness and compassion, we haven't gotten it. We don't understand how much loving kindness and compassion God has shown us if we aren't able to turn around and show the same to our fellow men and women. The Lord did all this for Hezekiah. Hezekiah did not do it for himself. But as the Bible says, he gave no return for the benefit he received. Let me ask you, do you? Do you give return for the benefit you receive from the Lord? Honey, is he talking about money again? No, I'm not. I'm talking about worship. I'm talking about love. When we sing, let my life be like a love song, is it? Is your life such that when God looks at you, he says... I love this tune. Turn, turn him up. <laughs> turn her up a little bit. I, oh, I just love her. This just makes me feel... Just watching, because I know she loves me. I know he loves me. I can see it. I can hear it. Colossians 2, verse 6 says, As you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. Hey, man, pride kills thanksgiving. Arrogance destroys gratitude. And then verse 31. Even in the matter of the envoys of the rulers of Babylon, who sent to him to inquire of the wonder that had happened in the land, God left him alone only to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. See, God is still in the transformation process with Hezekiah. But here is strike two. Strike one was pride. Strike two is boastfulness. 
Hezekiah is so proud of his riches and all that he's done. Here comes this envoy from Babylon. Why are they coming? Because they heard about what happened to Assyria. And they wanted to hear the story firsthand. They wanted to talk to this king and see how this guy, this son Karib, got driven out. So they send the envoy. And Hezekiah is just like, I got riches, I got stuff, I got treasuries everywhere. You know, he's just real proud of himself. And they come in, and he says, hey, guys want to see my storehouses? You want to see my treasure cities? You want to see my stuff? And he shows, listen to this, the envoys from Babylon, he shows them all the riches of Judah. I wonder why Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon would attack Judah in a few years. <laughs> Thanks, Hezekiah. Thanks for showing him, showing him our stuff. I mean, he just he's so boastful, he's not even thinking about what he's showing. That there's something here to take, and so Babylon will be back. And we'll take the people into captivity for 70 years. Strike two on Hezekiah. His pride was strike one. Boastfulness, strike two. You know, Satan does the same thing with us. When we boast of our righteousness or our goodness, Satan knows there is something there to take. There's something there he can get hold of. When he sees someone who is prideful in their faith, Satan goes, all right, I can work with this. I can take down a man of pride. I can take down a woman who is boastful. And so I encourage you, there is only one thing that we must boast in. And it's something that he cannot tolerate, and it is the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul said, Galatians 6.14, May it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And then Paul says later, From now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. There's only one thing to be proud of in your life, proud of what Jesus did to save you, which you didn't even do. And Paul says to the point that I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. That word brand marks in Galatians 6.17 is the Greek word stigma. Stigma. It means literally brand marks that masters would put on their slaves. You see the bruises, Paul would say. You see the scars from the lashings. You see this, this gash in my head from when I was stoned and left for dead. They're the brand marks of my Lord Jesus Christ. The stigma. Paul walked with a stigma. You could see his faith all over him. Do you bear the stigma of Jesus? You know, stigma in English means shame or dishonor. But the stigma of the Lord, when that is on you, it is nothing but honor and glory. When you bear the stigma of Christ. Verse 32. Now all the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and his deeds of devotion... Behold, they are written in the vision of Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amoz, in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. So Hezekiah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the upper section of the tombs of the sons of David. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem honored him at his death, and his son Manasseh became king in his place. So that's it for Hezekiah. Wait, Rick, I thought you said there were three strikes. There were. Pride was strike number one. Boastfulness was strike two. Strike three was Manasseh. Had Hezekiah, had Hezekiah not begged for and gotten some extra years of life, Manasseh never would have been born. Because Manasseh was born three years into Hezekiah's 15 extended years. Look at verse 1, chapter 33. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. 12 years old. And he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nation's whom the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. He rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah had father had broken down. He erected altars for the Baals and made Asherim. And he worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. Unbelievable. Here comes Hezekiah's son, who would not have been on the scene at all. But Hezekiah begs for extra life. God gives it to him. And along comes this wicked, the most wicked of all the kings, not only of Judah, but of Israel was Manasseh. Why would you say that? Because of how he's described. He did evil, verse 2, according to the abominations of the nations that the Lord drove out. The other wicked kings of Judah, or the kings of Israel, said he did evil like Jeroboam, son of Nebat. He did Israel, evil like the kings of Israel. 
Manasseh did evil like the people who were driven out of the land. He was so desperately sick. Look at verse 4. He built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said, My name shall be in Jerusalem forever. He built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. That would mean to the, to the sun god, Ra, and, and such like that. He, um, verse 6, made his sons pass through the fire in the valley of Ben-Hanam. He practiced witchcraft, used divination, practiced sorcery, dealt with mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Then he put the carved image of the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel, I'll put my name forever. And I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I have appointed for your fathers, if only they will observe to do all that I have commanded them according to all the law, the statutes, and the ordinances given through Moses. Thus Manasseh misled Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the sons of Israel. He had the distinction of being so bad, he was like the nations who had been driven out. Unbelievable. Here comes this King Manasseh. Hezekiah's letter in Isaiah 38, he wrote one thing that I think is interesting here. He said in verse 19, It is the living who gives thanks to you, as I do today. A father tells his son about your faithfulness. Did Hezekiah tell Manasseh about God's faithfulness? Doesn't look like it. It looks like this father, this king, strike one, was so proud of himself and his accomplishments at the end of his life and so boastful about it that when he gave birth to the third strike, Manasseh, he didn't bother in those last few years to teach his son, to tell his son that all this that you see, I didn't do it. God did. It's tragic. If he did tell Manasseh about God's faithfulness, Manasseh didn't want to hear it. So my encouragement to you is live the life God has given you and don't go looking for extensions because they just allow more time for sin. The longer the life, the more opportunity before you to sin. Now don't go rushing to go home. Do it in God's time. His time's perfect. He knows when he's finished. He knows when you're complete and ready to go home. So you wait for that. And until that day, serve the Lord with all your heart. And when that day comes, praise God that you get to be with him. So this 12-year-old son of Hezekiah succeeds him. And he spends the first half, roughly, of his rule reversing the revival in Judah, completely destroying it. In fact, Josephus, the historian, tells us Manasseh had every one of the righteous leaders that were there in Jerusalem executed. All of the godly men, all of those who truly followed the Lord, he had them killed. Tradition holds Manasseh was the king who took Isaiah the prophet had him placed alive in a hollow log and had the log sawn in half. And that's how Isaiah was killed by this king Manasseh. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 37 tells us of men like Isaiah. They were stoned, they were sawn in two. They were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins, goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, didn't receive what was promised. Because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Now, that might not sound exactly fair. I mean, Lord, how long will you allow the travesty? How long will you allow injustice? How long will you be patient while this bad stuff is happening against me in my life? Gang, we've got to realize something here. That even when things seem uneven to us... God is still at work on His overarching plan. And we're part of that. And it might not look even right now, but it will. When we see how it all works together for the glory of the Lord. Well, verse 10 says, The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. Just blows me away. God spoke to Manasseh after all this horror that Manasseh does. If I was God, I just would have gone... Okay, what's the biggest bomb we've got that we could just drop on Israel right now? I'm just through with this people. But he doesn't. He sends more prophets. He speaks to Manasseh. He says, come on, guys. That's not the Is God just weak? You know, I mean, forgiveness sounds nice for Sunday school, but come on. 
grace, <laughs> patience. These are all aspects of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they are seen as weakness in our world. To truly follow Jesus, you will be seen as weak. You'll be called weak, spineless. But for us, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Greek. And so we see in Judah something you need to note tonight. God comes to them again and again and again and again and again and again and He keeps coming to them and He gives not second chances but 49,000 chances. He continues to offer grace. Even at their absolute worst under Manasseh here, God is saying, come on guys, come on, come on, I I love you. Come on back. Here's your opportunity. Come back to me. That is grace. It is so much bigger than we can possibly comprehend. Part of the reason we have Second Chronicles here and the book of the Kings is so we can look at Judah and say, my goodness, God is still trying to forgive them. He's still offering them opportunity to come back. He hasn't stopped. His grace is just rolling on and on. And it's not weakness. It is the greatest power. And so we're told that therefore the Lord brought the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria against them and they captured Manasseh with hooks bound him with bronze chains and took him to Babylon the Assyrians were known for this they were known for their method of taking fish hooks or sometimes leather thongs and piercing directly through the nose and that would be the way that they drug slaves through the wilderness can you imagine that? it's a brutal people Sometimes they would take a leather thong and they would they'd drive a, you know, a spike through the nose. And they'd take the thong and tie it onto the nose and they would pull people to their destination. Why did Assyria take Manasseh to Babylon? Because at this time, Assyria still had power and Babylon was a vassal state of Assyria. Until Nebuchadnezzar comes along and Babylon grows in greatness and Assyria is completely uh, put to rest. Verse 12. Now this is absolutely unbelievable Manasseh when he was in distress the most evil king of all Judah's history he entreated the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers you know what's more amazing than that verse 13 when he prayed to him he God was moved by his entreaty and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem to his kingdom then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God what? This guy put his sons through the fire. This guy sawed Isaiah in half. This guy destroyed the revival of Judah and God forgave him? This has got to be one of the greatest turnarounds in biblical history. Unlike Judah's king Ahaz who just went deeper and deeper and deeper into idolatry, Manasseh actually turns around. He actually repents. He humbles his heart and has a real experience of repentance. Yeah, but look at what he did. Lord, how could you forgive him? He was vile. He was awful. How could you possibly restore this one who killed so many and did these things? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Manasseh ruled 55 years. The first half of his rule was horrible. Taken into captivity, he humbles himself and he's given another opportunity. And he comes back and he, he, does, he does try to make right. He humbly repented. After this, he built the outer wall of the city of David on the west side of the Gihon in the valley, even the entrance to the fish gate. And he encircled the Ophel with it and made it very high. And he put army commanders in all the fortified cities of Judah. Watch this. He also removed the foreign gods and the idol from the house of the Lord, as well as all the altars which he had built on the mountain of the house of the Lord. And in Jerusalem, he threw them outside the city. He set up the altar of the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings and thank offerings on it. He ordered Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people still sacrificed on the high places, although only to the Lord their God. So it's better than it was. 
Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and even his prayer to his God and the words of the seers who spoke to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel, behold, they are among the records of the kings of Israel. His prayer also and how God was entreated by him and all his sin, his unfaithfulness, and the sites on which he built high places and erected Asherim and carved images before he humbled himself. Behold, they're all written in the records of the Hotzai, or the seers, the prophets. So Manasseh slept with his fathers, and they buried him in his own house. And Ammon, his son, became king in his place. Ammon, by the way, his son, was obviously born while Manasseh was in wickedness because Ammon is named after the Egyptian sun god Amon-Ra. So this king Ammon follows his dad. His dad has an amazing turnaround, not so much for his son. Tells us verse 21, he was 22 years old when he became king and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of the Lord as Manasseh, his father, had done. And Ammon sacrificed to all the carved images which his father Manasseh had made, and he served them. You see, now his son is too rooted in the tradition to follow his father out of it. And he served them. Moreover, he did not humble himself before the Lord as his father Manasseh had done, but Ammon multiplied guilt. Finally, his servants conspired against him and put him to death in his own house after a long reign, you know, two years. But the people of the land killed or executed all the conspirators against King Ammon. And the people of the land made Josiah, his son, king in his place. So it was too late. Manasseh's turnaround, too late for Ammon. Not too late for his grandson, Josiah. And we're going to talk about that next week. I want to say one more thing to you all before we go tonight. And... um, in fact, would you turn over to Titus chapter 3 just for a moment? We're just about done. But in light of, of what we have just seen here, you know, we, we see the roller coaster ride of these kings. Has a guy who's just great. And then in the last 15 years, he takes a few dips. But he still ends up great. And then we have Manasseh, who is horribly wicked. And the Lord entreats him, and he's still wicked. And so finally, God punishes him, but he repents. God forgives. Absolutely amazing. Amazing grace. I was thinking about this through the week. And I I think very possibly the hardest thing to give out in the Christian life is grace. I think the most difficult thing for us as followers of Jesus Christ is to show grace. Law is easy. Law we can do. I can look at the right and the wrong of something. The moral truth, the value. I can, I can lay that on the table and see, you did me wrong. Grace is not easy. If you determine to be Christ-like in your walk, you have to show grace. If we are going to really be like Jesus, we have to be like Him in grace. You don't have another option. There's not another way to be like Jesus. But I want to warn you, if you determine to walk in the grace of Christ, the kind of grace God showed even Manasseh, you will be seen as weak, you will be seen as soft, you will be considered as spineless. People will ask how long you're willing to tolerate so-and-so's sin. And in fact, the very things that you may not personally, morally, righteously tolerate yourself, people will assume you're okay with because you tolerate it in other people. And I know this from personal experience. I know as a pastor, there are times where someone will say, how can you let that person even be sitting there in your church? And I think, how can I not? Well, so don't you draw a line somewhere, Rick? Well, yeah, I do. (laughs) I draw a line at abject rebellion when someone's living in a life of rebellion, not even wanting to come to the Lord. Otherwise, we've got to show grace. Do you think the Lord was okay with Manasseh's behavior early on? Absolutely not. Well, then why did he forgive him? Because he is a God of grace. That's what he does. That's how he acts. Do you think Father was weak or soft on Judah or on Israel across the years when he kept sending prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet? And you think at some point someone would say, God just must not get it. (laughs) These people aren't going to repent, but he keeps giving them chances. It's grace. It's grace. 
Titus chapter 3, verse 3. It says, We also were once foolish ourselves and disobedient, and deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. See, that's the way of the world. And we were there. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so I read that and I think, first of all, i got to remember where I've come from and how much grace the Lord has shown me. And when I think about that, it makes me a whole lot more gracious to other people. It motivates me to be a gracious person when I consider the grace of the Father for me. But secondly, gang, if we are going to err as followers of Jesus Christ, and I've said this before, we've got to err on the side of grace. If we're trying to make a judgment about something, listen to me. If you're not sure which way to go, cast someone out because, because righteousness demands it or show them grace because love demands it and, and you really aren't sure which way to go on it. Err on this side. Err to grace. If you're wrong, so be it. If I'm wrong, I would rather stand before the Lord and say, I did what I thought Jesus would do. I really did. I erred to the side of grace doesn't mean that we cast off the word. It doesn't mean we open the doors wide to sin and rebellion and cast a blind eye to corruption. No, we address that. In fact, grace says you deal with corruption. Grace says you confront sin. You don't just pretend it's not happening. You say, look, what's going on here is not right. And I love you too much to watch you just continue doing it. But grace means that whatever we do... Even when we make decisions, Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, when he said, cast out the immoral brother. Even then, you know the reasoning behind it? It was so that man could be saved. It was not just to get rid of him because it's the easier thing to do. Even that action on Paul's part was about grace. And that's got to be the motivating factor for it. We're going to talk quite a bit about this on Sunday. We consider what it means to be true soldiers of Christ. But I'll give you a little hint as to how it's done. It's just two words. Grace and truth. John 1.17 tells us grace and truth together were realized in Jesus Christ. And again, we'll talk about that more Sunday. Let's pray. Father, we are amazed that you showed grace to Manasseh, but we are thankful that you did. If someone as wicked as Manasseh could be saved, well, Father, then perhaps so can I. And I thank you that you showed us, you gave us this example, so many examples throughout the history of Israel of how you forgave your people and sought to bring them back. Of how they went and prostituted themselves to the foreign nations and idols and paganism. And and again and again, Lord, your kindness brought them to repentance. And you revived their hearts and you healed their land. And Father, we praise you for your grace tonight. And Lord, as we go out of here, I would just ask that if there's anybody, would you, would you show us in our, in our hearts, in our minds, if there's someone in our lives to whom we have not been showing that kind of grace, undeserved, unmerited, but truly Jesus-like grace, I ask you, give us the strength to show them the grace we have not been. I ask for a revival-type revolution in our hearts, a revolution of love and grace that would begin tonight, Father, just among those of us gathered here, would infect this body in a wonderful way that we might become the most gracious people, at least on this end of the island and in this region, that we might truly be seen with the stigma of Jesus Christ. And I pray this in His name. Amen.